It's Chris Simpson from the Stage Left Podcast. Welcome to episode 61 with Ed Blaney, a former manager of The Fall and right-hand man and compadre to uh, Marky e. Smith. Uh, what a chat we had, actually. He uh, travelled down from Manchester for a few days, um, down to London, and we uh, we met up. We ate some food, uh, cracked open a few tins of beer, which you may hear on the recordings, by the way, um, and recorded a belt of an episode. A special thank you to David Lloyd, also known as Bumble, um, former England cricket coach and voice to many of the games an expert ale pub recommender uh, as I was lucky enough to bump into Bumble in a bar in St. Lucia a couple of months ago uh, and he insisted I got on Ed uh, indeed uh, going through his phone there and then to give me Ed's number and he was the reason this uh, episode went ahead so we hope you enjoy this one Bumble. Um, as regular listeners know we do live supper clubs in our lounge uh, in London where we get guests of the podcast to do an intimate live acoustic set to just you and seven other fans um, whilst my partner Davila uh, who's an award winning chef cooks a five course meal for us all uh, and we sit down with the guest and eat great food, drink lots and uh, listen to vinyl records before the guest uh, plays a few tunes to us. Um, previous attendees have been Radiohead Live drummer uh, Clive Deemer, um, John Woff of the 1975, She Drew the Gun uh, and we've got James Walsh from Star Sailor on June the 8th too. Um, so get in touch on social media or email stageleftnights at gmail.com if you want to come. Um, word is that Ed is going to do one of these nights too coming up. Um, we're also going to veer off course a little bit on the 29th and 30th of May um, as the Cricket World Cup is taking place two minutes from our flat near the Oval. So we're going to kind of do the same type of night, but instead of musicians, it's going to be an ex-player or broadcaster um, as guest. And uh, so when the day's play is over, um, we can kind of carry on the party and enjoy uh, great food. Um, and this is kind of a test or a trial, if you like, with the aim to do it each night of the Ashes in September. So acclaimed uh, writer George DeBell um, is going to do the first one on May the 30th. So Bumble, if you want to get over and uh, pop over to us after the day's play uh, we owe you an ale for sorting this episode so that would be great for listeners globally who don't know what cricket is uh, just ignore the last 90 seconds of your life but you can settle down now to enjoy Ed Blaney on his time as manager of the fall and co-writer uh, with Mark e. Smith uh, special thanks to David Walford Alex Soikens and Andy Feeling for their behind the scenes work as ever um, so sit down enjoy relax crack open a beer like we did and enjoy Ed Blaney OK, welcome to the Stage Left podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. The podcast exists to provide free educational content for young musicians entering an increasingly complex industry by telling the stories of some of the unsung heroes behind the success. Go to stageleftpodcast.com for all episodes featuring musicians who discuss in detail the recording, writing and performing processes with the likes of Guns N' Roses, Elvis Presley, Kraftwerk, The Beatles, David Burry, Beyonce, Fleetwood Mac, Nick Cave, Oasis, The 1975, Bob Dylan and The Stone Roses. Today we are joined by Ed Blaney, a critically acclaimed songsmith who uh, is most well known for his collaborations with the genius and enigmatic uh, Marky Smith. First his manager of The Fall as well as bandmate and co-writer. Um, Ed became close friends with Mark and Mark indeed went on to guest on uh, Ed's solo records before Mark's untimely uh, passing last year. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into that collaboration as well as uh, finding out how someone goes about managing a band like The Fall. Uh, we'll be discussing Ed's new album, which is currently being recorded in Berlin, uh, the joys and headaches of coordinating your own uh, festival, and we'll be finding out if it's true that Ed chose to drop his first name from promoting gigs as gig-goers kept asking why he wasn't playing David Bowie songs at his shows, only to find out that someone else with the same name had won stars in their eyes as David Bowie the year before. So it's a pleasure to say that our guest today on the Stage F podcast is none other than the Salford legend, Ed Blaney. Thanks for joining us today, Ed. Hello. How's it going, mate? Good, very good. Good, good, Very good. good. Um, so you're recording at the moment in Berlin, or you have been recording in Berlin. How's that been going? Yeah, brilliant. So we've been out three times already this year, and um, it's the same place uh, we did the Severance in, um, 1950s cinema. Um, brilliant space, a great place in Vedding, and it was a no-brainer, really. It was like, like you know, let's, we was going to do it in Russia, and then Australia came up and we thought, you know what, it's a bit far. <laughs> uh, there's always a bit... So it's like, yeah, let's get back to Berlin. And uh, it's going great, but what we're doing this time, it's just me and the drummer, Rick Gibbs, um, doing the songs along with Tito, the producer-engineer. And um, we're doing it blind, as in we're not taking any ideas at all. Uh, the idea, writing process only begins when we get there and get off the plane. That's when the clock starts ticking. Is that a bit scary? Not, you know, you're exposing yourself, I guess, a little bit. It quite. is, it is, you know, considering I've got hundreds of songs and that that so have not recorded and done, and it'd be dead easy, but it's kind of boring as well, mm. like, to just pull out songs and you look at them and you think, nah, 
Um, but it is, yeah, because you do. If if it wasn't uh, challenging or if you want, didn't get nervous, it wouldn't be right. So it's good to have that, even though it's a bit backward. I must admit, but it's working. That's the main thing. It's with three songs in, rather than having like eleven ideas and then you might mm. end up with two. Yeah, we actually got three pretty much finished tracks, so it's great. And nice. We'll back out in May. And what are you writing about? Um, so the the rules on this one are not about love, no lovey stuff or anything like that. Not that, you know, and the last stuff was, was good, catchy and all poppy and stuff. But yeah, the, the, it's uh, it's more about life uh, without being boring mm. and a bit more anarchy, a bit more the real me, a bit more angst and, and what... deep deepness, but good deepness, you know. Nice. What are you trying to, like, what would success look like from, like, the finished product? Not in regards to release or anything like that, but when you, you know, when you imagine listening back to this when it's completed, what would you have wanted to achieve? Um, <laughs> I don't know, really. It's a good question, that. Re I mean, you're always striving to, you just want to be known. Um, appreciated as an artist and, and on the radio really you know mm -hmm. and on a few films and a few adverts you know it, it's bent the system as it is now it's nothing to do with how good your record is mm -hmm. now it's how much uh, your machine's been oiled and how much money's gone into the PR and you know like the BBC used to be um, you know really good if you were on the BBC it was a massive thing now it's a it's a commercial thing. It's it's more commercial than say ITV in a lot of really? ways. Really, I think so. Yeah. Um, in what way? Well, you got so you got like the DJs who, who pretty much think they're bigger than the artists themselves, and the profile has hard, and the probably fees they're commanding are. Mm. And um, you know you, they, they need to be took out to lunch, and they, they have their own uh, agents and stuff and PR stuff going on. Whereas years ago, you know, it was sacred. You know, if you, if you work for the BBC. Mm. You know, you respected highly as a, you know that, and uh, you, you know, like freedom and that. But you weren't allowed to cash in as such. Kind of way in, uh, you know, like with the fall uh, appeal sessions. You know that you did them because you know you agreed to do them because it was exclusive for the appeal show. Mm. And and then you know when this turned around and BBC became a bit more commercial mm. then all of a sudden you can buy them now in shops which was defeating objects not why you did the session in the first place so what are you going to do when it comes to this release are you going to be taking everyone out for lunch and no, no definitely no. not I mean it, <laughs> absolutely it's just, you know like I'm, I'm shocked I've never heard that That's yeah, really the, the, yeah the last album the severance um funny enough has had more radio than that than urban nature before which mm. had mark on it and we did pay a plugger five ton cheap. Really? Yeah. You know, uh, but it was the plug in that I did that actually got more radio. Janice Long loved it. Mm. Uh, me going direct. But yeah, the severance, I got run over the week before it came out, which was a nightmare. Got hit by a car. Shit. And um, obviously, because I managed it and do all the, we didn't do any press at all, but it ended up getting more radio than the one that we did pay. So that really made me think. Uh, that yeah, I'm on the right track. Wow, um, that's in regard. You just mentioned to urban nature there. There's um, I, I wonder if you what you're doing around the production at the moment in Berlin. But there was one conversation I was having the other night with um someone who is uh he's actually a, he's produced records for some amazing people. And I was saying I was listening to a song of yours called The Coat. Yeah. And I was, I was, and this guy, he's been like, he's an Oscar nominated um, songwriter and he's done amazing stuff. And I said, I heard something today that I'd never heard anywhere before, which is, I listened to the coat and my understanding was that was a background recording, something that had been left on. And is it right that Mark E. Smith couldn't find his coat? Was that right? And then you, did you put some music over the top of it? Is that, is that? No, correct? no. Oh, okay. No, my no. interpretation is very No, that's there. good. I don't know that I want to put the fire out. I mean, it's, uh, so it was about, the story was, uh, a landlady where I used to stay. Right. And uh, a few years ago, Mike used to come round and we used to, you know, put through our party and, and uh, you know, I, she used to always hide my coat, you know, and he, and he thought we had something going on, so it's a bit, he's, <laughs> he's winding me up, but it was actually a live recording. Of you having a conversation, well, did it we, intend to be a song? Was it supposed to be a song? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was, we, okay, great. Okay. We did it, yeah. We, we, we said, right, let's, no big, uh, 
thought process, but we said, right, let's go. And then we did it. We had a couple of notes. And uh, kind of like a Radio 4 thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, that, that's, that's kind of how, how we did it. So you had stuff. lived a lot of it? So yeah, yeah, like, completely. Oh, nice. yeah. And, and there's a bit where I, I mean, thank God I got to edit it, you know, because he, he's definitely pressed my buttons. <laughs> 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 but you didn't hear that in the uh, final thing. But th th that kind of just free fall production is, is, you know, what I love doing. That, yeah. You, know, you can over rehearse things and, you know, generally the first take's the best. Right, okay, because I think I saw you say that um, you did some a lot of takes with Mark and he would just do stuff in one take and that would be it and he'd be, he'd be done, that's what he wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah they are, you know, because you can, you can go on and on and on and, and as I've got older, I've got better at that. I've not been so picky. Yeah. You know, I'm the worst critic of myself. So it's great to have someone in the room that says, that's good, that's good, that's fine, leave it. Because you just go on forever and then you end up losing the magic. And that, that, that's what's good about that track. It's got that live magic, you know, genuineness in there. Awesome. And there's another track I really liked on that. There's a couple of really uh, great tracks on that album that I picked out. One was Thinking of You. That was with Marky e. Smith as well. Yeah. The organ sounds amazing on that. Is that you playing that? or is that... It's, it's, uh, It is, yeah. Um, it sounds gorgeous in the chorus. With that one, um, we recorded half of it in a shop that I had upstairs. <laughs> right. Um, got Mark round put the drums down and then in January I won a cottage on eBay for 62 quid and it was an amazing cottage in Holmforth where they filmed Last of the Summer Wine. <laughs> right. It's always got to be a story of me so I was like right so I phoned the band text everyone and said like there's no lifts here's the address I've got a cottage for the week and uh, whoever comes comes and so whoever whoever came made it on that record and we did the second half of it in there uh, the almond and stuff Sounds lovely. And it, and it was great, you know, it was great, uh, really good. It, it was on the top of a hill, like, dead steep, so that was a bit crap. We had to go to the shop for the milk and stuff, <laughs> and cigarettes and the beer. That, that was the only downside, but we actually won it again. I won it again about three weeks later and went back and did a lot more production than that on that album there, yeah. Do you win anything to get out to Berlin? No, that was... <laughs> Do what? You didn't win anything to be able to get out to Berlin or anything? No, no, just that, that, that was a, a stroke of genius. Look how we found that studio, you know. Again, it's just blind. And it's an, old, it's, it's an worth old cinema. Taking, yeah, it's worth taking risks, you know. If you take a risk and you're out of your comfort zone, then, then you're on to a, a winner straight away. You know, mm. if you're doing it at home or... Like, I don't rate any studio at all in Manchester, you know. Even if it was free, I wouldn't take any of them up. You know, they're all rubbish, pretty much. Um, Why is that? Do you think? Um, just, just, just living in the past. You know, all living in Sweet Sixteen was probably great. You know, in the eighties and early nineties, and you know, and then in the seventies, you know, you had everyone who was everyone had done stuff there, and that was actually in Rochdale. Mm. You know, but it, it's just that um, you know, you go in and it's like right, we start at ten, and it's some posh get, you know, looking at his watch, and you can't smoke or you can't, you know. And yeah, you have to be quiet, and you, 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 I can't work in them, mm. uh, you know. And, it, and it, if you get to five to ten, and your session's finishing at ten, you know, you want to carry on. Mm. You know, you, you can't talk. Oh no, that's it. You know, you, you might just be so. I have always uh, tried to avoid that um, scenario, and they, they all come with that, you know. Or the engineer will be like, oh, hang on, I just got to text my bird, or. And, and you know you can't have that when you're recording. Yeah. Or they'll be stoned. You know you can't have an engineer who's stoned or hung over from the night before. You know you got yeah. to be really professional. You're from Salford, and we've listeners all over all over the globe. And there may be some people who've not heard of Salford or been to Salford. So, describe Salford to listeners who've not been. Um, it's the ultimate shit hole, <laughs> like of, of poverty, where like it, it's a great you know you, you're proud to come from that. And, yeah. And you, you're hard. You, you, the minute you're born, yeah. You know that hardness is instilled into you and the community and stuff. You know. And I say like shit often because that that's how other people like yeah. to say it. But 
you know, if you're born in Salford and you're from Salford, you know, it's, it's, no. it's like a unique thing and it's bizarre for people who don't know that because it's right next door to Manchester. Mm -hmm. But we are completely different. And I always say there's a story. So there's a River Irwell that surrounds our city yeah. and runs through Manchester. And the story has it, you know, when the Romans arrived, I don't know what year it was, I won't go in history, but they took one look, they were camped in Manchester. And they took one look over the river and they said, you know what, fuck that, we're not, we'll stay here for the night. And that became Camp Street, you know, mm. that, that, that's actually true. So they never crossed the river because they thought, no, we're not going to go into there. And it's just a great place. I've never been able to leave it. And, you know, you're just proud um, of it. You know, Peter Hook said something the other week, you know, it's probably the best thing he's ever said, a quote. Um, and, and it just is, it's just got that thing, Salford, where, you know, you're in Salford and we're, we're very different, you know. A lot of the great music that gets tagged Manchester and the great things, mm. it, you know, they're all Salford. It's actually Salford, right. Coronation Street, you know, Salford. Really? Oh, yeah, right, okay. you know. And you say it differs, how would you describe that difference? Well, you know, I noticed the other day when I was in the shop near my, my bar, um, the girls serving me had just a slight different yeah, accent mm -hmm. than the, the girls from Salford. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's bizarre, but we, we, there's just a different mentality, I think. You, you're always... Um, because of the poverty that... Well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, Dirty Old Town, for instance, you know, the song, it's all in that, you mm -hmm. know, and at the moment, it, it's booming Salford, you know, it's, you wouldn't think it, mm -hmm. it's poverty everywhere, but... Underneath that, it's Salford has just got a real spirit about it, and, and it's that, uh, you know, that fight. You always, you always get up and you feel hard done by, and mm. you got to fight for what you want. You know, mm. if, if you're in a band, for instance, when I first started, first band was Trigger Happy. As soon as they hear you from Salford, oh, you know, they don't want to put you on, so you forever really you backs up all the time, yeah. Mm. You know, and it's like we don't want Salford in here. You know, and it's nothing of my generation, it's from generations before, or uh, like, you know, the old club nights, the old Salford are coming down and, and the alarm bells will be ringing. So so that that's just with you, whether mm. you're posh or you're not, you know, mm. whatever class background you're from, that's, if you're from Salford, you know, that the people's eyebrows generally raise. Mm. Interesting. So I'm from, uh, the reason I laughed when you said shithole is I'm from <laughs> Romford, and that is when people ask me what Romford's like, my go-to word is shithole, basically. But it's which a is glorious, you know, glorious yeah, shithole. Yeah, yeah. You've know. got to be proud from where you're from, right? Oh, completely, yeah. Um, you, uh, we, we had, sorry, we had, um, you might know Stuart Lee, he, he's been a big fan of the Fall Road for years and years. He came on the podcast a while ago, and he said that, um, uh, my life would be very different without the fall um and it got me thinking that it's probably all, in all of us there's a band or an artist who if that band or artist didn't exist you'd be quite possibly quite a different person who would that band or artist be for you 100 percent um well split between probably dylan though on that sense um you know i was a massive neil diamond fan as a kid mm -hmm. great songwriter my dad loved him and you know the irish in salford you know, everyone was in Neil Diamond, you know, come on from the pubs and open the windows and you'd be blasting Built music out. out. But, um, you know, so I was quite off the rails when I was like 14, 15, 16, with drugs, you know, young and nervous. And um, I just heard a record of Dylan's and... Uh, Which one? It's you know? off, off Desire, Old Sister. Mm -hmm. You nice, know, your yeah. mama sees the future like your brother and yourself. You never learn to read or write no books on your shelf. Mm. You know, um, your daddy is an outlaw. It, it just, and it just, just hit me right in the face. And uh, I stayed in my sister's bedroom for three days and uh, with some hash and withdrew. And, and that was it. Never looked back. You know. So Dylan was the one? Pretty much, yeah. What other Dylan stuff kind of is ingrained in you apart from the desire album? Um, I mean, you know, we went through the religious phase, didn't he? And that, just a great songwriter, you know. Really. The religious, I, I, I think the religious phase. I some, love of them, it. some of the songs are really, really good, yeah. yeah he won like, a Grammy, didn't he? For did the, he? Um, he's got to serve somebody. Right, okay. You know, but it, it, it's, he's a great songwriter, yeah. you know, amazing songwriter, you know. Um, there's, there's not many, it's, it's weird doing music, but I can't stand going to gigs and I run a festival and yeah. I can't, you know, I just... Have you seen him live? 
Dylan, yeah, yeah, I have, yeah, a couple how of did, times. How did you find it? Because he obviously ch- he's well known that he Seen changes. Him in the... Birmingham, and it was rubbish. Really. It was just, you know, it was all right. Yeah. Like, you know, but I was only young then, like 85 or something. But then I seen him a few years ago in Blackpool mm. at the Opera House, I think it was, and it was amazing, oh. absolutely. It was annoying because he weren't doing what I wanted him to do, you know, mm. the, the tracks all yeah. the way, because he always changed them. But it was it was such a, a master class. It was amazing. He was 70 odd. Yeah. And uh, I actually, uh, you know, I got back to the hotel and had a great night. And uh, I've had a few beers, I was pretty pissed. And I rang Mark and left the right message on Mark and his phone saying, You need to get your shit together, you know. I've just seen a 72 year old there, you know, who's actually delivering and you need to deliver and stuff. <laughs> I remember waking up in the morning thinking, Oh shit, <laughs> you know, what have I done? And then we laughed about it after, and he said, no, you were right, cock. He said, you were right, that. You know, you were right what you said, and, you know, I, I hope you like the new stuff and that, you know. I did take on board what you said, but I was actually drunk when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a test for you. What was the name of the first song you ever wrote? Um, one that's never been released, and it's funny now looking back. So I wanted, you know, I didn't start till I was 27. First song I ever wrote. Mm-hmm. Um, I started writing in Amsterdam when I turned things around. Um, but there's a song, and I don't even know what it's called, Never Mind the Nonsense, I think it was called. And um, I, wanted, I didn't have a band, I wanted to do it, and you know, got the confidence. And then there's this band said, Right, do you want to come and have a go? So I went down on a Sunday afternoon and uh, they said, Right, you know, what, what are the chords? And I was like, I haven't got a clue, you know what I mean? And they said, Well, I'll just sing it if you want. And and we did it, and I thought it sounded really good. And uh, they, they said, uh, you know, I waited and waited, and then it was, oh, sorry, we've, we've, you know, we've, we've all had a chat, like, band meeting, and uh, we, we just don't think it's right for us. And I was like, oh, you know, fuck you, fuck it. And I wonder, you know, within six months or something, I was playing the Hacienda with my band, and I thought, you know, and they were all, you know, they definitely didn't carry on the music. Mm. So I think that, that was probably the first song I ever wrote, yeah, and the most significant one. And when you just mentioned the Hacienda there. You told us before we started recording that you used to have some of the Hacienda dance floor, is that right? Yeah, yeah, well, I had... Um, so Tony Wilson, t- two people gave me a break, really. You could say Marky e. Smith and um, Anthony H. Wilson. Um, you know, he... he our, Trigger Happy was a band from South. We had a reputation, great band, no nonsense, you know. Good stuff. Um, you got playlisted on Radio One, right? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no money behind it. Just you know, sort of band, all the usual stuff coming with it. And Wilson um, sent two of his younger managers, John Drape and Bobby Langley, to see us in London, and uh, we played in the Orange Club in Kensington. I don't mm-hmm. know if it still exists now. And um, great gig we did, and they're dangling bags of coke. Saying, oh, stay down, stay down, and we were like, fuck off. <laughs> we, we were back to Salford in the minibus. Wow. That was hired in someone else's name because we had to get it back. You know, we, someone had stuck the neck on the line. And then um, it was obviously it was the right move not to stay down and get off it. And then Wilson offered us a room in the Hacienda. He said, look, I've got no money to sign you. I think you're brilliant what you're doing. And um, we'll give you a rehearsal room you know, set of keys, effectively, to the Hacienda. Yeah. Bananas. They had some rooms upstairs called the Glass House. And he said, in a 500 quid account at Johnny Roadhouse, go and get yourself a guitar and an amp. So I did. And, uh, you know, we took him up on that. So we practically lived and my marriage was over by then. And, you know, I was just like, uh, into doing my music and my band. So we'd come out of the Hacienda off it and then go straight to the rehearsal room, which was amazing, you know. And I wrote Rude all the time, um, which is a, mm. one of my most popular songs mm. in there. And that, that was thanks to Wilson. And as I was in there, I remember it, uh, the Hacienda was having difficult times. And I actually remember Wilson coming in with all the pieces of dance floor wrapped in like a yellow floor tape, um, wanting to sell them. Uh, and, and he was getting laughed at in the office. I think they were a pound each. This was like in the 90s. You wow. know? And then some weirdly bizarre coincidence you know some I don't know 20 years later or something I ended up buying these bundles of dance floor that I had to remember seeing 20 years before for 50 quid I mean you couldn't you couldn't write it 
you know. And he, he, I'm very spiritual, me, and, and stuff, and I believe in things. And, and Wilson's always been around me. Mm. And, and, and in the same way, Mark has, you know, Mark's seen me as that. And, and even though he's gone now, mm. I still feel him, you know. And, and a lot's happened uh, around the time of his death. That That's kind of benefited me in a way. Or, or you know, a lot of good things have happened. And it's kind of what I've earned, I suppose. But, yeah, I've rumbled off a bit there. But, yeah, you know, and Mark like Wilson the same. I think that was the same with uh, the Fallen factory. Mark nearly signed for them. Mm. But, the, you know, I think there was bigger money in London. What ended up happening to the dance floor? Um, so I got, uh, sold a lot of it. Paid my bills. I uh, gave a lot away to charity. Mm. Actually, burnt some. So there's a film about the Ascender. That's right. Ascender. I haven't seen it yet, but I believe I've been stitched up. You know, they've edited it, so I just say, "Yeah, I burnt the dance floor," <laughs> but they didn't tell the story about you know the. So what happened? What when I burnt it? Yeah. No, well, well it was winter and uh, kind of like enemy at the gates. You know, times was hard, but we um, we were having a laugh and we'd had a few beers and. Uh, Mark was there, and you know, it was a celebration as well to burn it. Mm. Just just a piece at a time, didn't go over the top. Um, and yeah, burnt a few pieces, you know, just just like off it, keeping one, but enjoyed doing it, you know, because it wasn't all about money, you know, but, oh, you could have got this and that, but it wasn't about no. the money, it was the, the lot, joy of doing it, and you know. A lot of memories tied up in all that, I'm guessing, yeah. as well. Um, Tony Wilson. What would someone now in this generation learn from Tony Wilson the way he did things? What's, uh, what's missing well, from this generation that Tony Wilson? You know, like um, all your music colleges and everything else. Like, you know, it used to be really hard to go to uni and get on a music course. Now you, you can get them anywhere. So he would be dead against all that. It's kind mm. of like the X Factor's crossed over into mm. that. Um, you know, he's like, uh, you know, he should be written, he, he was a one-man band and uh, he, he just kept true to his loyals and it wasn't all about the money. And, and if he believed in something, he backed it and, you know, he, he took London on and won, in a way, you know, and he was behind, you know, when he opened the gates and, and it wasn't just the Happy Mondays, all, all the, the groundwork had been done mm. decades before. Uh, but what a guy, you know, and he, you'd see him at gigs, you know, if he come to your gig, he'd be there with a, a Mac on, a dodgy raincoat, like, you know, at the back of his collars up, and he'd keep a low profile, the ultimate A&R man, you know, and it's gone now, in a way, there's not many like that, is there, mm. uh, if any. So what are your fondest memories that you've got with uh, Tony? Well, uh, I don't know if they're the fondest, but uh, so one year we applied to be on uh, In The City, which was massive. Mm -hmm. And we got through as Trigger Happy. And then I got a phone call and I was over the moon, you know, so hard to get a gig from Salford. And and it, there was no favours, it was genuine. We got through, it was like, yes, buzzing. You know, we're going to Belfast. It was in Belfast. And uh, then I got a phone call saying, uh, you can't go because of your name. And I fucking absolutely hit the roof, you know. Shit. Um, but, but funny enough, that was before I got the room. So I, I threatened him, like, you know, phoned up and snapped and said, if we don't go, you know, this and that, stupidly, but just, just, you know, mm. I was like, what are you fucking on about? You know what I mean? You can't do that because of the name of the band. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're not going to shoot anyone, trigger yeah. up it. Yeah, Because yeah. of the troubles in Northern course, Ireland, yeah. I could understand it. Yeah. Um, so, so probably that, you know, and then I heard in private that, you know, he absolutely admired me for it. And um, then we did, we, we, we got on the year after as a consolation in Glasgow, but it was a bit shit because I was like, look, you know, I really respect you, I always have done, and, and you can't stop us playing. And he wanted us to, we did change the name uh, when we were under the wing of the asset to Trigger X while we tried to find something, but we never found out, you know. <laughs> and, and Trigger Happy was, you know, if you look in the dictionary, it, it's Trigger Happy and it's got Ed, and I actually just opened a page once and it was there, and, you know, and it was to trigger an happiness. Oh. To grab her. That's what the music was about, not to shoot someone. But because it was from Salford again, you know, all, negative kind all of that thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. So you really were up against it. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. Ways, yeah, Can, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let's talk about the time when I think you were playing with Trigger Happy and 
the rumour or legend goes that um, that the whole of the fall kind of walked out on Marky e. Smith and he needed a man to step in and you guys stepped in. Is that true? Is, is that what happened or not really? Uh, sort of. So he, um, I did a... We, we, you know, he used to, Mark used to be at all our gigs and um, he offered me um, the role as tour manager. So I said to him, I'll tell you what, I'll do it if Trigger Happy can support you on the main dates. Nice mate. So he agreed and um, we'd done a couple of them and I had the fall then staying at my house, um, the band, and they were, they were all over the place. Great album, The Nutrable. But live and off stage, what a bunch of idiots, you know, couldn't uh, put it any clearer than that, being polite, and they were just all over the place. And it was inevitable they were going to go, and the night before, uh, I mean, were, a couple of them were digging in my house and all that, and I was like, listen, I'm not having yeah. that, you know what I mean? This has got, you know, Mark's like, don't beat them up and that. But I wanted to, and, um, but Mark, Mark had his own reasons, they did sound good in rehearsals. We pulled up, Mark was slated them all, and uh, they said, look, we've had enough, and they got off that night. So they was ringing me, and I was trying to talk them down, saying, look, you know, we're going to Dublin in the morning. And they were like, fuck you, fuck Mark, you know. Uh, blah, 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 and it was like, right. So I listened to half an hour of that, and then I said, well, do you know what, then fuck off. They've not had on the train back yeah. to London anyway. So I rang my band, and I said, look, we're still going, but we're not playing. You're in the fall, you've got um, eight hours to learn the set. And, and that's how it, it, it came about, as real as that. And how do you, firstly, so how do you go about that? Because that, ha- that can happen to musicians. So what is the process? Are you immediately saying to Mark, right, what is the set list? Here's the set list and you're learning off the record? Or is he sitting there talking through the songs? How did you actually well, we was to- We was great with uh, Crisis, is me and Mark. You know, we was just great together. You know, that's when me and him came to our best, um, you know, um, and he just said, right, you know, you, you know, let's do this song. You, you saw it out, basically. So I was like, oh, cheers, Mark. Mm-hmm. And so we did just said, look, learn these songs. And uh, it was bizarre. It was Dublin, you know, and it was uh, it was very bizarre. And he's like, don't let anyone backstage and that, you know, keep it all under that. But we did pull it off. And the crowd, the claps was like, you know, because Mark could fall over and he'd say it was genius. Mm. But we pulled it out of the bag, you know, we pulled it out of the bag that night. Uh, we, we just managed to do it. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. But it's great that you kind of thrive in that time of crisis. That's uh, that's really interesting. And when going forward and when you played further gigs with him, how did the band select the set list given there was such a body of work? Like there's hundreds of songs they could have picked from. So how did that go about? Did you have to learn all of them or before No, we it was always about the new stuff and um, the greatest hits and that gigs weren't allowed, you know. It was, you know, the band had said, oh, Mark, can we do, you know, can we do this one? You know, and he'd, he'd say, all right, then chuck that one in. But there was only ever one or two, you know. So it was always touring them. What was ever, what was the newest the thing? The new out stuff, yeah. Right, okay, I got you. And um, Stuart Lee said that he would go to see like say four nights in a row, and two songs could be completely different. Um, like one song could be four minutes or twenty minutes. Was were you just given kind of leeway to do whatever you wanted, or did? Well, I was. You know what I mean? I, I don't. <laughs> I don't uh, ever ever admit to being in the fall. Do you know what I mean? Which yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't a member of the fall. I was, you know. I want in the band, you know, I just came on whenever I wanted and did whatever I wanted and, and Marty say, look, you got carte blanche, you know what I mean, do whatever you want, so I did. Wow. You know, and if I couldn't be asked going on, I won't, you know, I was doing a lot behind the scenes. But no, they they were always there, uh, you know, the, the, the band would try and have you think that they was, you know, when Mark was just a drunk, was it? Mark controlled everything, you know, mm. and, and I helped him. And, I mean... Th- with the with the kind of relationships that Mark had with some of the people in the band, how would you advise a manager about managing a band like the Fall? <laughs> You've been through it all, man. Like how how the fuck? Jump at it, you know what I mean. Jump at it, jump at it. Jump in with two feet, you know. That's what I did. And I had like two, three days' notice to find him a band. Um, I've originally to find him a drummer. You know, when I did this deal about the supports, he said, right, yeah. Uh, if you're under a day car, he said, oh, by the way, I'm playing in uh, London on Monday, I need a drummer. You know, and I was like, right. I said, and he said, then the tour starts Wednesday. This was on a Friday. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll start it by Wednesday, which I did. 
you know, but it was great, you know, and I had to borrow a couple of grand off my sister to pay for the, uh, the, the tour bus and stuff like that, and it was a great experience, you know. You know. What about managing the personal relationships between members of the band? Because I mean, he obviously he famously had quite like a, a bit of an acid tongue, and you know, I think he um, there's like I've seen a, a few places that like he had these hilarious put downs, and one of them was like I can't work with him anymore because like he was eating a salad and stuff like that. Is <laughs> the reason why Mark sacked someone because he was eating a salad? That was a last straw. How did you deal with that as a as a you know, yeah. as a manager? Like he was famous for that. Well. I, I, uh, one of my, you know, well, I lost my virginity, if you like, and the thing was the first night in Dublin, and um, some guy come backstage, and I'm out saying, you know, keep, keep everything sweet, don't let anyone know what's going on with the new band and stuff. And this guy's there, uh, from the Virgin Prunes, um, and he's like, hey, Mark, oh, yeah, and all that, Harold, Mark, and Mark's like, shut up, you're not going to have a beer. And he said, oh, Bono sends his regards, and sorry you couldn't make it tonight, but uh, you're invited to the castle after he said, listen, tell Bono to go fuck himself. <laughs> and I, I stood there and I thought, I like you two, you know what I mean? And I thought, right, okay, then this is, this is how it rolls, is it? But he was dead genuine. Yeah. You know, and he was right, he couldn't be arsed with all the, 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 the rubbish and, and when band, band members got told how it was, you know, they deserved it, you know. Like, we weren't an e-taking band, so some of the band were taking ease, it's like, well, do you know what? And, and when they got up in the morning, the heads were like, you know, mm. all over the place, it's, it's not what you need or you're allowed a drink and that or what, you know. But we weren't really hard, me and him, you know, while they were all thinking they were in Oasis, that's what yeah. he used to say, you know, you're not fucking in Oasis. But we used to pay more than what you get in Oasis. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And what do people not understand about Mark? So if you meet the old person who was a fan of Mark E. Smith, you, having been such a close friend to him, what what do people not understand about him? Uh, I don't think they understood the, the, how genuinely nice he was underneath, and I understand why he was so pissed off when he was. And you know, if you've been in the business that long, and you've met that many people who are fake and that, and he's seen it all, and he's seen members trying to overthrow him and form their own groups and stuff. I think you just you just build a certain skin, and 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 that's why he was so thick skinned and and so you know, sharp tongue with people because he's seen it all and done it all. But beneath that, you know, he was a really nice guy who just like wanted a pint and sit down and talk about football, you know. Just just a normal working bloke. What made him happy? Um, I did. <laughs> you, know, he's, he's, you know, he used to have some great times together. Uh, just getting away from the band, really. You know, when we break away from the band, that was when he was at his happiest. He never did that, you know, he couldn't stand, really. He'd, he'd do the bit where he had to have a drink in the bar with the band for a little bit, just for prep talk. And then, then you know, soon he's like, oh, thank God for that, you know. Like he wanted to do, when we were doing the spoken word stuff, he's like, this is the way forward. And the Smith and Blaney stuff before we broke, is it we were getting off of more money than the fall getting off. He said, this is great, cock. It's just me, you, and a, a Tasha case, you know. Mm. Way forward. Um, he, he just, I think just like, you know, our nights out, we used to have some great nights out, you know, and they weren't like nothing to do with music. So that's really interesting. So he, he was quite happy because it strikes me from a distance and not, obviously, I'm nowhere near meeting him ever, but he's, he seemed quite an unhappy person. Would you say that would be uh, inaccurate then in that case? You think he was quite um, in, yeah, I think if he'd have been anything other than the person he was, his career would have died 20, mm. 30 years ago. I think that's what kept people interesting. Cause, but it wasn't an act. Yeah. It, it was a weird one, but he was always working, always, always working away on something, you know. But when it was time to stop work, then he'd say, look, that's it, you know, let's have a pint. When uh, you, you were someone like Mark, who's, who's written so many songs and come up with so many lines, what was the creative kind of well he'd go to when he had a blank piece piece of paper in front of him? Like when you've written so many songs and been doing it for so many years, when you were with him, like where where do you even begin? Where, what, what you, where was he finding his in inverted commas inspiration lyrically, for instance, in that situation? Well, you know, um, 
He, 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 he just writes his stuff, wasn't he? He just writes his stuff, but he was a big fan of my lyrics. So, mm. like, I wrote mm. lyrics on I Wake Up In The City. Mm-hmm. And it's funny when that come out, you know, and it's, like, really rated and puts all the best rhyming couplets he's done in 22 years. And it's like, you. <laughs> you know, and he asked me to ghostwrite, and I said, which I refused to do, you know. But he respected me for that, you know. Yeah. And I used to challenge him lyrically and, and push him, you know, and say, you're not having it that easy, you know. And, and, and he'd do it, you know. I mean, some of the stuff he wrote, amazing. Yeah. Very prophetic as well. Yes. Can you give examples? Well, um, the Towers, when we did Are You Are Missing Winner, you know, World War Three, World War Three skyscrapers, skyscrapers, and that was mm. literally two months. We did, I think we released it in, in, I don't know, it wasn't far off. Well, it was certainly recorded before the Towers fell, but um, Crop Dust, yeah, some lyrics in there, and it's like, wow. And we was in America at the time, 10 weeks after we toured America with that album, and that was a bit bizarre. How did the stuff go down? Great, great. Yeah. Sold out every night, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Four, five, six encores every night. All wow. of them times, you know. People talk about the fall in the 80s, great. You know, that lineup would not have made it in my band. Mm. Not a chance. It was sloppy, you know. Mark was always, you know, they weren't, it was... It, you know, the, the was he hiring the wrong people? Like, why? Because it's quite well, a constant, isn't it? Just, that the band it, was sloppy. Or with the, a lot of them, they just just get sloppy, and then they get jealous of the lead singer because it's all about the lead singer, and everyone wanted to interview Mark and talk about Mark, and Mark was the persona. Mark was the fall. You know, and it's like even when they left, um, you know, twenty odd years. I mean, you, you're not in the band anymore. You know, they're, 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 they're still on Jules Holland, they're on Glastonbury, and they're not playing the songs that they played when you were in the band. Get over it, you know. Mm. A lot of many, many members, you know. And I think everyone put a shift in, but when your time was up, just accept it. And they're still trying to hang on to it now. You know, I, I'm, I'm talking. I was never in the fall. You know what I mean? Mm. I did what I did, and I enjoyed it. You had a great um, gig. Sounds like you had a great gig, kind of not being a full time member of the full, but being able to come in and do what you wanted live and that. Kind yeah, of thing and manage you know, it, it was well. great. And then, you know, the, the band was like always um, a challenge, but we always looked after the band, you know. Mm. They might say different, like in the book The Fallen, I mean, some of the stories in there, and credit to Dave Simpson, he told me that he edited it, thank God. You know, and I think people just imagine things and stuff and say things, you know, my memory's pretty good. Um, we, we looked after them, the band, you know, and they were very lucky. I mean, where else would you get 100 quid a day? Mm. All your food, drink, and everything else from mm. the hotel and driven everywhere, and burgers yeah. delivered to your room. Not many bands would, you know, yeah. do that. Yeah. Well, I wake up and I sit up. I look around to see who's with me. All the thoughts that will love me. Can I? You were saying that um, you kind of negotiate with Glastonbury like a really uh, decent uh, rate when you played there like a, a few years ago. It's such a such an eye opener with the industry. Um, in regards to um, let's talk about live. So obviously you played sometimes with the full, but obviously you're on the side a lot of it as well. Think about the time you saw the band most laughing on stage. What had happened? When was the ha- when you saw the band kind of most enjoying themselves on a stage? Which band? The full. Um... Probably the, the penultimate gig, is that what that means? The best gig was San Francisco, live in San Francisco. And uh, it's actually released that recording. And so I'm saying, and it was the only night I didn't have to go on. And the girl who was looking after the venue and the booking, she, uh, it was the first proper, she said, do you want a drink? And I said, yeah, I'll have a brandy and coke. Mm. And it was the first proper brandy and coke I'd had in America, where it was in a tall glass, you know, and I was like, Remy Martin, it was like, brilliant. And all I had to do was stand there, the band went on, it was like a 70 minute long train, non-stop, and it was incredible. And there was like 800 people, great American music hall, it had sold out. And, mm. you know, that was a moment where I'd delivered. And, and I think it was, uh, it was, it was only a few gigs, a few, nights into the tour but we'd done all the UK, we'd done all Europe and that was that was, you know, Mark was buzzing for Ed, you know, when take us back to America. 
and I did it and uh, that, that was probably the best gig ever for me. To be stood at the side of that stage and just, just enjoyed myself and didn't have to go on, didn't have to change anything, didn't have to rescue anything, you know, it was mm. just a, a, an amazing night. Compare that to, what was it like in Moscow then? Because you played some, you, you toured in Moscow as well, I think, yeah. is that right? Um, what was that like and how did that differ to your expectations? <laughs> Complete opposite. Well, I'd been through a car windscreen three days before and I was still suffering from concussion. Shit. Half my face was black and blue and I had a limp. Uh, but I looked the part in the suit we went with black eye smoking on stage as I was playing. <laughs> Remember that? Um, Mark was late one night and uh, the promoters weren't happy. Uh, and it was very much a mafia thing, you know. Not really? Gonna lie. Well, I didn't know that till I got there, but it wasn't. I was on a deal where, you know, I brought a fall over and I could have what I wanted. And I said, well, I have champagne. I said, we can have unlimited champagne, you know. So I was like, right, I'll have that then. But the first night, Mark was late and uh, from the hotel and they wasn't happy and they had to give refunds out and stuff. Really? And he wasn't happy at all. And they said, look, you're all right, but him. You tell him, you know, if he doesn't fucking, you know, if he's late again tomorrow, he'll be going missing. We'll drop him off in the middle of fucking nowhere. This is Russia. I was like, okay, no problem. You know what I mean? And they said, and your your champagne's finished. And I said, is it? Yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> and uh, I absolutely hammered it more the next night. And you know, when you're in a restaurant and they give you the, the leather uh, booklets with your receipt and they had them here, there, everywhere, about 25. Yeah, well. Um, but I think it was just nerves with Mark. Really? Yeah, it was nerves, you know, Russia and that. You know, it was big, they'd never played Russia before. But people had travelled like hundreds and hundreds of miles, you know, to see him. So what was the crowd like? It like? was amazing, it was great, yeah, it was on fire. Did you play St. Petersburg as well? No, it? just Moscow. Just, just two Moscow. Nights, yeah, two nights in Moscow. Fucking hell, it's amazing. Drink the law, drink the law, drink, drink the law, drink, 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 drink. Okay, so let's talk about the festival that you were running for a few years. Yeah. Um, it's in Salford, right? Yeah. Now, you you, you gave uh, opportunity to 1,200 bands, I think, over those years. Um, but you always kind of said along that time that it was a it was a bit of a stress and it was a challenge all the way through doing that. I once put on one festival in Dagenham and I retired the day after I did it because yeah. it was so stressful. Um, what advice would you give to festival organisers, given your experience? Uh Again, just do it, you know, I mean, I look back now and it's all, well over 1,400 bands and I, and I see some of the lineups and I think, fuck you know, how did I do that, you know what I mean, I can't even remember, like, biggest year, 342 bands, 22 venues running consecutively, I have no idea how I did it, there was no money, no funding, but I did it and and it's like, wow, you know, and I did it last year, I've had one year off since 2010, I did it again last year and it was the smallest number of bands smallest uh, number of venues um, and the stress was just the same. Really? So Why? I learnt that, I don't know, but that's one thing I learnt from last year that the, the, the amount of stress level was just exactly the same as having like, hundreds of bands on. So what's the lesson there? What, what would you advise just someone? Just carry on. Could, yeah, carry on and do it, you know, at yeah. least you've done it. And it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, if you do it for free and, and it's a success and that, you know, mm. great. You know, you've had everyone's had a good time, and you know we had like catfish in the bottom and on before anyone heard of them, and loads of other artists, you know, and, and some some come back and say cheers, you know, thanks, you know, you give us a slot when no one else would even mm. give us a slot. Cause so you, it's that. Because you once said that you, um, you to get on festivals uh, like the really big festivals across the UK, you need to have an agent or know someone, and you kind of went the other way and gave opportunities to bands that you know other places weren't weren't uh, taking on. Can you kind of unpack that for us, if you're a young band now, how you get on festival bills and what the barriers are? Yeah, don't fill in them forms online where you have to sign up to something and that's a complete waste of your time and, and you know, upload this and all that rubbish, you know. I won't name them, but they'll mm. know, you'll know who you are. Stop it. I mean, just kidding people, you know, sign up for this and then, you know, nobody even listens to your demo for a start, you know. The only way to get on a festival is, you know, if you're a new young band, is just do whatever you think you have to do and use every blag and trick in the book. 
because that's the only thing that's going to work. No one's going to do you any favours. It's going to be you with your skills or one of the cheeky one in the band. Let him deal with it or her deal with it. Um, you know, and just 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 do the, the old fashioned way. Send out CDs. Oh, we don't do CDs. Don't, just ignore that. Send out a CD. You know, because there's something when a CD arrives at your house or whatever. You know, he's got more chance of being listened to than than doing it in the mail or the way where you know, it's a very difficult thing because it is even more so now, because most of the festivals have been bought up by the same company. So there's one booker that's booking nationally, and it's really, a joke. oh yeah, so it's the same lineup pretty much on every festival, all the big ones, apart from Glastonbury. You'll find, you know, it's like right, you know, they don't have any say most bands, do they? And it's like, here's the festivals you're doing this year. There's 11 of them and you're playing eight with that band again. And you're not, you know, there's no money in it, you know, but at least you don't, you know, get on the bus and stop moaning. That, that That's how it is. So if you're in a young band and you can get on a festival, just, just get on. I mean, I'm not into these competitions. I think it's demeaning. You know, people need to have a word with themselves. It is, you know, it, it is the X factor that's crossed over into normal rock and roll. Which is a disgrace in my, you know, and I feel sorry for them. I'm like, what do you mean, vote for you? Vote for you to be on at half one in the afternoon when the gates opened at quarter past, and they're still hoovering up, you know. And and they're pushing it, aren't they? All oh, vote for us so we can get on. And I was like, yeah, but there's nobody who gives a shit. You know, yeah. you're not even gonna be on the poster. Yeah. You're opening a bar, is that right? Yeah. Tell us about your bar. Uh, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, space. Uh, it just came about. And I've uh, been after the venue for a bit. Uh, three minute walk from Piccadilly train station, yeah, bar, that's YE and four hours. Um, yeah, great, you know. So we, What's we, the aim of the bar? What's the, I've no idea, it's just again, it's just one yeah. of them just, just going with it and letting it evolve itself. So we've had, we, had a we opened with a student exhibition, an art exhibition, which was really good. We've had a few bookings in from that, and the uh, live music first night is uh, a week on Saturday, yeah, which my band will be playing as well. Cool. Uh, Under the name Blaney? Yeah. Nice. So that, that's going to be good. Are you playing any of the new stuff? or? I think so, yeah. I think we're going to, yeah, we're going to start. So obviously having your own bar venue, it's great, so we're going to set up all the gear on Monday, um, and we'll be rehearsing in there next week. Which is great, you know. So we'll, we'll just just see how it goes. That probably do about eight songs or something. Yeah, nice. We're cracking lineup, and again, it goes back to opening doors for new acts. So my daughter's playing, who's doing well at the moment, off her own back, and then there's another band, the C33s. There's a young band from London, Moses, who are playing. They've had a bit of so. I'm doing it all right again. Get opening doors for new acts and stuff, and it's free entry. Awesome. So that's going to be good. Cool. Well, it's certainly going to pop down there when uh, next in the area. Um, you've got, is it right you've got five kids? Yeah. How does uh, having five kids change you as an artist um, compared to someone if they didn't have any kids? Well, Dylan's got five, hasn't he? But really? Way, I think, yeah. But, um, yeah, I had mine when I was young, so uh, by the time I was 23, 24, I had five kids, which is unbelievable now. You know, my youngest is 25 and none of my kids, you know, I'll be a granddad this year, which I'm looking forward to. Um, brilliant. I won't change it for anything. I can't remember much of it, you know. Does it change you when you're writing, thinking my kids will hear this? Uh, Do you change? I used to, I used to, my kids used to, you know, ask me to play to, to send them to sleep. <laughs> you take that two ways, really. Yeah. Don't you? <laughs> but in a nice way, I think, you know, which 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 is stayed with me and yeah Bianca who's do chosen music, she's doing really well so that's nice and and yeah I mean I just think well what would I be like if I was them and my dad was you know I'm fifty now and I'm not uh, no sign of me slowing down you know and, and I'm not pissing in the wind or kidding myself you know I have a good time and mm. I've done all right out of music myself doing what I do and I'm enjoying it. It's like this Berlin, this new album, I think will be my best without a doubt. Not that there's out wrong with, and, and that's me, I'm telling myself there because I can hear my daughter and my head, she always says don't, you know, my kids love me doing what I do with my music, you know. Um, and and, and it, I don't know, it inspires you in a way, you know, to think that 
obviously there'll be a day when I'm not here, and that's going to be a shit day, isn't it, for, for my kids and everyone else. But, you know, you'll, you think, well, I'm more conscious now about what I write. So there, 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 there are things in The Severance, you know, which is a symbolic album of cutting away from stuff which I have done, all the dead wood I've left that behind. And so this 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 new album is free. Mm. And, and, you know, first uh, things on it, people are loving it, you know, and saying it's the best thing I've ever done and that that's really good. So we'll we just carry on with that. And I, I just feel uh, glad, really, that I've had five kids and, um, you know, I can't change anything. You know, years ago, I would have loved a normal job but I've never, you know, I've always done my own thing. Mm -hmm. It's not for really lack of trying, it's just how it is, you know. I'm a, but most I'm people have a normal job would probably prefer to have your lifestyle. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Like the experiences maybe. you've had, you know what I mean? You know. So, um, what was the biggest setback in your career and how did you uh, <laughs> overcome it? <laughs> um, being from Salford, probably. Really? Yeah, and it still goes on now. We're still discriminated against, you know, there ought to be a movement against that. Yeah. Because it is true. You know, I've had, I had no idea, wow. You know, if, if you've got an opinion or you've got something to say or you're actually a bit clued up, then that goes against you because mm -hmm. you, you don't want that, you know. People just want you to shut up, get that over and then do get the next one in, mm. you know, and if you've got something to say. So I think probably coming from Salford, you know. What's the uh, most important piece of kind of music memorabilia you have? So something from your career that you really, really cherish, that if the house is burning down, your family are safe, what's the thing that's most important to you that's related to music that you have? Um, probably nothing, if I'm being honest. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got a few, few bits. I'm not that. Um, I just think you can't take it with you. You know, I mean, you know, you're as good as your last gig, and whatever you've got, you know, and whatever time you've got, enjoy that and uh, clear out the decks. What's the best bit of advice someone's given you? Jesus, I've had quite a bit over the years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Probably Mark, in a way, you know, that would be a nice one. So on, on the album, um, the Smith & Blaney album, there's a track, When We Were Young. Mm. Uh, and at the end, uh, I've cut Mark's voice in and he just says, just carry on, keep doing what you're doing. And yeah, so before he died, Mark, last meeting we had, you know, he said, listen, you know, you're top mate and everything, and uh, you are a true friend. And um, toughen up, toughen up, you know, keep doing what you're doing and don't let anyone, you know, take the piss and that. So probably Mark, yeah. How did he view mortality and how did he view his illness and um, how things Before were? he told me he was going to die, I knew what he was going to say. And we had this, you know, I don't know about psychic stuff going on, but we were both a bit out there like that and believing stuff. And I knew before he opened his mouth what was going to come out of it and he was scared I think yeah he was scared you know genuinely scared about it but I didn't see him uh, months before he didn't want to see anyone he didn't want anyone to see him in the state he was in mm. but I know he was happy his, his sister you know he'd seen stuff about me in the paper uh, with my new album and he'd heard the severance and he loved it he absolutely loved the tracks he heard you know um, feel the rain, he said, that's a fucking it. You know, he said, just edit that, this and that. So he, he did have a land in a bit of the production on it. But, um, yeah, I think he was scared, which which, which he would be, you know. Mm. You know, because uh, he was almost like a cockroach, Matt, you know. He never thought he'd go. Yeah. He survived a lot before. He, he did, he? you know, when I first took over, I used to think I'd find him dead pretty much every day in the hotel, you know. Really? Some mornings, yeah, I'd think, Jesus, is he going to be alive? Yeah. And he, and he outlived most of his critics, didn't he? Yeah. Which was great, and we yeah. laughed about that. We, we had some laughs on that before he died. It wasn't all sad. Um, and how did you find out? On the news, or did um, you...? My um, guitarist, I knew it was coming. Yeah. I pulled my social media couple of days before, you know, I knew it was coming. Really? And stuff. Um, so I, I, I knew, like, Jesus, long, long time before, and I had to manage that. So mm. obviously I obviously talked to a few people in the press that I knew who was sniffing, and I said, look, this is what's going on. 
I didn't tell them the full story and, and mm. they said, look, work with us. And, you know, credit to the press, they did. I they kept a lid on it, yeah. Good. Which and, is nice. And how are you, like, how are you processing that stuff? That's some heavy stuff to have to process over the last year and stuff. Yeah, I mean, Jesus, it knocked me for six, you know. Um, even if you know it's coming when it actually comes. And he was, like, one of my best mates, you know what I mean? And we used to have some top times together. And, and it wasn't always work stuff. And then, so I've never, never lost a mate before. Mm. You know what I mean? So he, 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 you know, I have, I have moments. I'm all right now, and you know, he'd say, "Don't be a soft cunt." That's what he'd say. You know, <laughs> some matter with you. You know, but um, yeah, it, 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 it was difficult for a while. You know, but I think I just cut myself off. And then when I made that uh, film, yeah, tribute, it's a beautiful you know, that helped film. me a lot. Yeah, that, that really, because that, that's what I wanted to do, and. And I got to do it, so that that got a lot of things out there. So strongly recommend listeners to check that out. So it's on the website. So yeah, is that right? Y E four Rs. Dot And yeah. it's through YouTube as well. It's a brilliant tribute that Ed's done to Mark. That's uh, really really beautiful. Um, what are some of your proudest moments um, in your career? Now doing what I'm doing now, standing up, doing this new album. Um, you know, I'm signed to BMG on the publishing. They need to pull the finger out if they want to keep me for the next album. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Get collecting them royalties and just carry on inspiring people and being there for my family and my friends and my kids. Really. So, what are the classic stories you tell your grandchildren when they're old enough? So you're just becoming a grandfather soon. So, what are the classic stories you're going to tell them when they're old enough? Well, you know, there's that many. You know, there's there's, there's that many. There's that many. Come on. Uh, just just be yourself and be. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, have you got an hour? You know. <laughs> There's so many great stories, uh, but the positive ones are always the best. What's your favourite one? Come on. I could probably couldn't pick one, you know. Uh, just, just, just to keep fight, you know. In in a generalised thing, it is just, you know, keep going. Mm. You know, don't listen to people putting shit in your head, you know, and uh, defy the odds. I definitely sense that from the talk today that it's like. Don't look too much in the past. Like, yeah, don't, definitely don't yeah. look back, you know. It's, Keep going forward, because you never know, you know what I mean? You never know, you could be, game could be over in an hour, in a day, a week. So just, just live and I'm always evolving and, and I'm probably at my best now than I've ever been. What fears do you have about the music industry going forward? And how would you address those fears? Well, those fears? I think it's completely fucked. Anyway, as it is so, I don't think the fears could get any worse. You've got artists uh, disillusioned, thinking they're going to make it. There's nothing to make it for mm -hmm. when you get there. You know, there's nothing on the top of the hill. You know, penny a stream, penny a play. It's a difficult one. So, you know, for me, it's just about um, enjoying it. You know, if you can enjoy it and you can cover a few of your expenses, then then just do that because. It's not what it was, and I, and I don't want to sound old or or miserable, but it's just not the same. And even though a picture will be painted, that it looks all beautiful, and you know, underneath that, the artist will be running up thousands and thousands of pounds and living out of the means. And then that's when the you know the boulder arrives at the end of the two years or whatever, and they realise they've just wasted two years of life. So just just keep control of it yourself and. Uh, for me, for fears, it is, yeah, you know, my, my fear is, is a reality I see every day, you know, and, and, and I feel sorry for people who, who, who are disillusioned by it, mm. you know, and the sold marketing packages, like courses, you know, I, I'm totally against them because I think, why don't you just be honest mm. and, 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 and tell them how hard it is to actually earn money? Mm. You know, if you're in a covers band, you'll get paid, mm. or, uh, you know, if you're doing stuff like that, you know, or corporate stuff, you know, but uh, doing original music these days, you know, it's so hard and I don't even think the publishers can do anything about it, you know, because mm. they're forever being undercut. So it's kind of at itself, it's real. I've got nothing good to say about it. Other than and that's because of the streaming, right? Yeah, streaming has absolutely killed music, you know, mm. and people, you know, only the, the die-hard hardcore fans uh, appreciate a CD. Mm. And the vinyl, you know, vinyl's had a boost to send that, but half of it's bullshit. Yeah. You know, it's not sold that many, you know yeah. what I mean? It's making a comeback and all that. It's just a great market ploy. It's worked. 
for some, but for others, it hasn't. And generally, the people who are buying the vinyls are the age group that would have bought in the first place anyway. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's not yeah. like engaging like 16 or 17 or, year olds. Or they, yeah. they, they just lost it. But, yeah. you know, I don't want to sound like too negative. If you do music and you're in it, you know, go for it. And Because, you know, it, it literally, I was trying to put a number on it last night and it's like 0, 0.1% that actually make it. And then you got to ask yourself, what is making it? And mm. then at what price does that come to you as an individual? So just enjoy it, you know, just enjoy it and stuff. Do it for you, not for anyone else. Great advice. Um, any ambitions left? What are the what yeah, are the major I want ambitions? this album to absolutely go worldwide and um, get. You know, I think the, the last two albums, the reviews have been great, and you know, just because we've not had fifteen, twenty grand to put into the uh, is out on my label, but I want this one to really travel. Hmm. Yeah, and end up, you know. Well, it sounds like it's going well. Um, thanks for coming down. Thanks for sharing your insight, your stories and experience. You've lived a dream of many, actually, and uh, we wish you well with a new venue. Can't wait to hear the third album uh, when it's good to go. Uh, and I'm guessing that will be available to check out on Blaney.co, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, nice one. And yeah, is the name of the bar, so we'll check that out near Manchester Piccadilly. Hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for being such a great guest on the Stage of Podcast. Very welcome. Thanks for having us. All the best. Nice Cheers. one. Nice one. So that was Ed Blaney. What a top man, hey? Um, such a likeable character. Um, and we really, really enjoyed having him on the podcast. There's so much crossover in what he's trying to achieve and I think what we want to do going forward as well. So we did have some kind of chats afterwards about how we can work together in future again. So watch this space for that. Uh, remember, for more episodes featuring like Stuart Lee, the comedian, uh, recorded just two days before actually Mark E. Smith passed away talking about how much the fall meant to him uh, go to the stagefpodcast.com uh, you can also follow us on twitter at the stage pod like us on facebook at facebook.com forward slash stage of podcast um, and there's loads of episodes with the likes of tony visconti on on recording uh, black star uh, steve cropper on writing sitting on the dock of the bay with otis redding that's a how wits of an episode um, and Aziz Ibrahim on playing the Stone Roses too um, so plenty there to get your teeth stuck into uh, we'll see you next time for Jess Greenfield of Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds <laughs> <laughs>